to those who worship her, she is Chomalungma, goddess, mother of the earth, supreme progenitor of all beneath her. To those who climb her, she is Everest, ultimate challenge of self against altitude, demanding a dreadful toll of all who dare, one dead for every three who reach her summit. In Toronto, Canada, a girl born normal deteriorates as she grows into profound mental disability. Diagnosis, Rett syndrome, a newly identified disorder which affects only girls, cause and cure unknown. Prognosis, early death, a terrible, tragic mountain of medical ignorance faced by a father who refuses to accept it. What if both mountains, both obsessions, were combined? Could they be climbed together? Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, the only Hindu kingdom in the world, a staging point for Everest expeditions. This city, sprawled across its valley at the foot of the Himalayas, is home to some 300,000 people. Most of them, by our standards, exist in extreme poverty. Once a mecca for the dropout, tune-in hippie generation of the 60s, Kathmandu today has returned to its traditional way of life. It is here we find members of the Climb for Hope expedition. They have been waiting close to two weeks, unavoidably delayed. A telegram advises Chinese authorities in Tibet of the holdup. Uh, problems at this end, we have been stopped by a landslide on the road to the Chinese border. The slide is located at the Nepalese village of Chaku. They already set out for Everest once. Their equipment sent ahead by truck is still out there, somewhere. Fortunately, the trucks have been sealed by Nepali customs, and therefore we have two problems. There is frustration One, and anxiety, two, not least for the father of a disabled daughter in Toronto who gave wings to this dream. Uh, I know that as she gets older, and she's uh, 13 right now, that uh, scoliosis starts to set in at those particular uh, uh, years. Seizures could come in at any time. Um, I don't want to think about that. I want to look at the positive side of it. And so what I'm really looking at uh, within the next five years is to find the cause of Rett syndrome. Mount Everest, wow. I tell you, I've been saturated with Mount Everest for so many years. Damn, I don't want to imagine it anymore. I, don't, I want to be there. I want to experience it. I want to touch it. I want to put a cramp on that mountain and say, well, at least I was there. Two obsessions, two quests came together and set in motion years of effort by hundreds of people. Some 9,000 meals to prepackage. Specialized clothing to design. Equipment to manufacture. Sponsors to be found for funding. I guess we built it up from a a five dollar, uh, one round of drinks to a million dollar operation. All to attempt two peaks. One, a medical mystery. The other, Everest. Six days behind schedule, the party prepares to depart Kathmandu for the second time. Boarding the two chartered buses, ten climbers, five support people, Nine family and friends, a film crew of four, and five Sherpas.
the Everest Canada 91 expedition, the climb for hope, gets underway. The route lies northeast from Kathmandu, 120 kilometers to Kodari, and Chinese customs at Zhangmu in Tibet. 350 kilometers through Shigar to Rongbuk Monastery and base camp at Everest. Easy travel, or so they think. The buses face steady grades as they grind into the foothills of the Himalayas. They meet colorful local traffic en route. Stop at the village of Lamosangu. Had they chosen to climb the Nepal side of Everest, they would leave the road here and trek 14 days to the mountain. Instead, they board the buses and press on to climb from the Tibet side, an option not open to Westerners until 1980. The clouds drop lower and wetter as they climb. This is the main road between Nepal and Tibet, opened to foreigners in 1986 and named the Friendship Highway. The further our party proceeds, the less friendly it seems to become. One thing is noticeably absent, maintenance equipment. There's nothing for it but to pitch in, either that or back up to Kathmandu. Little do they know that worse, much worse, is yet to come. It was only a matter of time before the inevitable blocked them again. Another massive landslide. There's no turning back this time. The decision is made to hike the 20 kilometers to the Tibetan border and the promise of Chinese army trucks beyond. There are times when they tend to forget that this, on the map at least, is a major international highway. Just around the bend, pause for serious thought. A mountain is in the process of falling on the road. With a lookout to watch for action above, they decide to run the gauntlet. Either go for it or forget Everest. Miraculously, only one of them was hit and lucky to survive it. The next day, a tourist from France was killed here. They pass a tiny oasis of humanity surrounded by falling rock.
carrying gear for crazy white men who climb mountains. Brutal loads over brutal terrain for a few cents is a major source of currency for these people. For them, landslides are a bonanza. At last, the village of Kadari and the border with Tibet. To everyone's relief, the equipment is waiting for them, but the road ahead, seven kilometers to Zhang Mu and Chinese customs, is blocked by a dozen slides. They will have to walk. Porters will carry the equipment, all nine tons of it. One by one, they straggle out from Kadari, across the Friendship Bridge, and into Tibet. This is not pleasant hiking country. The jungle crawls with leeches. Much of the underbrush is nettles. The landscape is sodden, streaming with monsoon runoff. The box contains fragile communication equipment. It weighs about 120 kilos, roughly the same as a household fridge. The man carrying it weighs half that. One of the climbers tries the load himself. He was nine-time All-American gymnast, incidentally. He manages to pack it 10 meters. How much that weigh, Al? It's like 250 pounds. Yeah. Three porters pack the box over seven kilometers in three hours. At the end of the hike, the town of Shangmu in Chinese Tibet, where the expedition arrives a week late, where Chinese customs are a law unto themselves. Climb for Hope straggled into Zhang Mu, fully expecting a welcome from the waiting Chinese. What they got was a bill for $4,000 for delaying the trucks a week, plus another for $3,000 in customs duties. <laughs> Hundreds of porters are waiting to get loads. The trucks, it turned out, were on the other side of town, stuck beyond yet another landslide, several kilometers away and over a thousand feet higher up the hillside. It was more a debris torrent than a landslide, sweeping all before it, including the road. People hurry through between rock falls. Beyond the slide, Chinese transportation was waiting. From here, the road lay open to base camp at Everest, over 300 kilometers away. <laughs> In no time, the jungle gives way to scrub, to subalpine shrubs, to tundra-like grasses on the Tibetan plateau.
The plateau is an enormous bench land along the northern flanks of the Himalayas. Most of it is above 14,000 feet. The climate is desert, much like the Arctic, with a brief two-month growing season. Eking out an existence here is no easy thing. Life expectancy is about 40. Many Tibetans live as nomads, others practice subsistence agriculture. A pause en route for the expedition is a bit like stepping into a friendly stone age. These people had never heard a tape recording in their lives. Shigar, last town before Everest. Here, as everywhere in Tibet, the Buddhist spirituality of the people is evident. The Chinese annexed Tibet in 1950 and imposed communist rule on a land where one quarter of all men were monks. Thousands of Tibetans were killed. Over 6,000 monasteries were destroyed. In 1960, the Chinese mounted an Everest attempt of their own. First step, force Tibetans to build this road from Shigar, over 100 kilometers to the mountain. In 1980, they opened it to Westerners. The expedition reaches the Pang La Pass in the foothills, over 16,000 feet. All right, guys. A little lightheadedness seems in order. For the first time, they glimpse Everest. But now the effects of altitude are being felt. Headaches, difficulty breathing, increasing heart rate, loss of energy. A slow process of physical and mental deterioration has begun, which, given time, will end in death. From this point on, the expedition becomes a race against time. One surprising monk and a bend or two later, and there she is, Everest. At her feet, the Rongbuk Monastery, highest inhabited place on Earth built to worship the mountain nearly 2,000 years ago. The monks invite the expedition in for tea. They serve a concoction laced with salt and yak butter. It is roughly five kilometers from Rongbuk to base camp. People prepared to risk their lives on Everest would rather walk than ride at certain points along the way. For years, the focus of their efforts has been this bleak expanse of gravel. Base camp at Everest. The mountain extends a cool welcome as they struggle against altitude. Reached too quickly. 
and cutting wind. They are now 17,000 feet above sea level. The snow should be letting up by now. They try the phone for the first time. Got an answering machine. <laughs> oh, it's got an answering machine. Yeah. Ain't technology marvelous. They try another number. Eric Hobson, this is your brother Alan Hobson at Base Camp Mount Everest. Not that you can think of it for That box of equipment they packed from Canada to Asia, from Nepal to Tibet, <laughs> and all the way to Base Camp at Everest, surely one of the world's most remote locations, lets them dial home direct. Cheers. It's nothing short of miraculous. <laughs> the days of waiting at base camp, of watching the mountain and her changing moods, are time well spent acclimatizing to altitude. Their lives depend on how well they adjust. The team doctors conduct a seminar. So in other words, your weak point are your lungs, cerebral edema, you get uh, <coughs> swelling of the brain. Even as they listen, cells are swelling in their brains and lungs. Pressure is growing in retinal capillaries. Death can occur six hours after symptoms appear. Here. Uh, there are windows for uh, the poor person inside to uh, look out and hopefully not experience too much claustrophobia. The gamma bag is a quick fix for emergencies, like being inside a pumped up air mattress, good for a simulated drop of a few thousand feet. The question why, why do they try remains unanswered as ever, except at this time, there is a reason we can comprehend. Another mystery to solve, half a world away, a young girl and thousands like her. Time for wives and friends to head down. Less time spent up here, the better. A hard parting for some. A fear of last farewells. Hardest parting of all, perhaps, for the father of a young girl in Toronto. When you're faced with the reality of your dream, it just feels really good. I feel the team's fantastic. We're in front of the mountain, and all we have to do is strip up to the top. <laughs> I wish them all the best. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ernie. Have a good trip back. Bye. Okay. He was ordered down by the doctor. It shouldn't be snowing like this. The monsoons should be ending. In the eyes of Tibetans, Everest is a goddess to be appeased before violating her sanctity. The Sherpas asked the monk to come and pray for the climbers, a gift of profound faith and fear. They raise prayer flags to appease the mountain. On a rise above base camp, team members find good reason to respect the mountain. Previous teams erected the markers in memory of members they left behind. Most recent, an Austrian who died this year above the North Call on the route the Canadians will take. They had asked the Chinese for 45 yaks. The herders arrived with 30, which promptly took over the campsite.
With the arrival of too few yaks, the team has to revamp freight plans for the trek to advanced base camp. Several tons of gear and supplies are batched and loaded. How these animals pack such loads over rough, rising country at altitudes with less than half the oxygen at sea level is astonishing. The expedition moves into moonscapes of moraine through rills and eskers of gravel spawned by Everest. Their route lies up the East Rongbuk Glacier for some 15 kilometers. The trek will take two days. On the second day, under a closer looming Everest, they reach the foot of the North Call Icefall and the site of the advanced base camp. The work of setting up advanced base camp looks easier than it feels. It lies at over 21,000 feet, about the same altitude flown by intercity commuter jets. One consolation for the cook, bread rises phenomenally under low atmospheric pressure. But it takes a half an hour to boil an egg. It sits somewhere on that slab later. These people are proven mountaineers. Their footprints are on many of the world's highest peaks. Yet still, they must wait to acclimatize. Let their systems catch up with altitude. The Sherpas are better off in this respect. Their genetics evolved where they live at 13,000 feet. Few Everest expeditions would succeed without their support. The team meets to review strategy for the assault. These are the slopes, the slopes to the north call from ABC that I'm really concerned about because of the avalanche potential. It's killed more people or as many as any other route on the mountain. One of the problems is to try and come up with a few decent days to be able to take loads, dump them on here. We're looking at moving about 75 or 80 loads. The campsite here, we're looking at putting in two tents so that we can put four people on the, on the face or on the ridge here. And then from there, this is where we would start to use oxygen. In, uh, from 25,000 feet to actually carry from here to the Camp 6 at 8,300 meters. And we're looking at moving about 10 loads in there. 12 bottles of oxygen, which will give us, for four people we're putting in two tents again, will give us an opportunity of putting four people in there for three days. So that's it. We're looking at a one-shot summit attempt. Uh, the route from here then goes straight up the North Ridge to join the Northeast Ridge, and then is a 12 to 15 hour day up and over the first step, and uh, past that, up and around the second step to the summit. So remember, the climb is for RET, the climb is to raise funds for them, and exposure for them is not to leave bodies on the hillside. The assault begins. First task, pack some 80 loads of gear up a series of massive ice benches and establish Camp 4 on the North Call, over 2,000 feet above. The idea is to cut trail, lay lines for others to follow, set up a milk run to move those loads. Under normal circumstances, a six-hour climb. Circumstances are anything but normal. Every day, fresh snow blankets the climb. 
They have to start early, while it's cold, while the snow is safe. They must reach the call or get out of there before the sun gets high and hot and avalanches begin. Day after day, they struggle in vain. The North Call continues to elude them. The monsoon so far has caused us a few delays. I'd say it's put us back about 30 or 40 percent. Um, the snowfall today is already a foot, 30 centimeters, and getting worse. But it can be gone in six hours of hot sunshine. So it, the weather can be it can be really good, it can be really sunny, it can be, it can snow five feet and then clear up again. There should be a window, a gap of clement weather between monsoon's end and the start of winter, but it barely opens. They begin to hate that 2,000 foot hill. Altitude is sapping their resolve by now. It affects them all, some more than others. Despite a constant state of exhaustion, sleep is well nigh impossible, fraught with fantastic dreams when it comes. Coughing fits indicate the beginnings of bronchitis. Blinding headaches and nausea blur concentration. After three weeks of trying, they finally make it. The first climbers breach the cornice of the North Call. Reaching the North Call is just a first step towards the peak, over 5,000 feet above. As they move along the ridge to establish Camp 4, they're higher than Mount McKinley, North America's tallest, by over 3,000 feet. It was an achievement to establish Camp 4 without mishap. Over 40 people have died trying it in the past. What lay ahead up the North Ridge to Camp 5? The possibility of injury, or worse, had to be faced. If I was the one that was hurt or killed, I would want the expedition to still continue on. It's all the more reason why we're here. It's not because we're here as a bunch of climbers looking for something to do. It's we're here for a challenge, and sometimes the challenge will, you know, take one of us or hurt one of us, and that's even more reason to everybody to get back out on their guard and go for it. He was among the first to head for Camp 5, up where a climber from Austria a few months before had died. His view on accidents would be put to the test, and they would continue without him. The thing was in front of me, and suddenly he just uh, goes from one side, like at the rope, to the other side, and his feet sink in, and he twists, and he fell on his back. And I, I think I heard clock. I heard a, a snap. He's up there in pain. Extent of injury, unknown. Unless rescued, he could die. Dawn, two days after the accident near Camp 5, the rescue team heads out to bring the injured climber down. He has been moved into a tent at Camp 4 on the North Call. It has taken a full day to rig equipment for the rescue. The climb leader at Advanced Base Camp supervises the operation. The best way to do a lower always is just to use gravity and go straight down. In looking at the route up, there's only a few hundred feet 
in a couple places that you could actually lower Tim in a sleeping bag in a bivy sack straight down. They have to move quickly. With daylight warming comes high risk of avalanches. The injured man is largely unaware of what's happening. Morphine has killed the pain and dulled his senses. It turns out that ligaments in his right knee have suffered serious tearing. He'll be disabled for months. Appreciate. Well, I'll tell you something. You've got a lot of things in your favor. What? You've got your age, you've got your strength, you've got incredibly good muscles above and below. And that's what protects the knee. And uh, your good health. <gasps> and that all helps heal things. He sets out for base camp on a yak ambulance. It will be 10 days before he receives medical care in Canada. By now, altitude is seriously affecting the team. Minor medical problems are much amplified at, at this sort of altitude. Uh, I'm a prime example, for instance. I've, I've had uh, a bronchitis now for uh, between three and four weeks, and it has not been improving, and it's unfortunately prevented me from getting above 22,000 feet. Uh, had I been uh, at something close to sea level, this thing would have been over with in a, in a week or so. For me, it's been severe headaches, uh, lack of coordination or uh, dizziness at times, uh, a stumble over my own feet. And at the same time, which has been the more disabilitating for me, was retinal hemorrhaging in both eyes. So it's taken about 30% of my vision away. Time is running out. Resolve is weakening. Increasing danger on the mountain weighs heavily on the climb leader. I've come to, in the last three years, appreciate all the people here as good, close friends. That's probably the worst part. I think that uh, death in the mountains, for me, in terms of res uh, res responding to accidents, I can do that to people that are arm's length, but uh, it hits hard when, uh, when it's friends. I'm prepared to keep climbing and, and uh, keep moving if that's what people want to do. And that's what people do want. In spite of physical and mental deterioration, the obsession to reach the peak prevails. On the first day without snow in three weeks, two of the Sherpas make it to Camp 5 with a tent and some oxygen. Other team members set out to pack loads to the camp, supplies required to climb to Camp 6, and the summit assault beyond. This is their sixth week above 20,000 feet. In terms of capacity to function, to think clearly and climb, they are down to about 10% of normal. Overriding all other perceptions, an unimaginable fatigue in which even the obsession to succeed begins to evaporate. As if irritated by their presence, resentful of their feeble struggle on her flank, the mountain throws a curve at them. It comes quickly from the west. A few warning blusters, and then in no time, winds over a hundred. Retreat to Camp 4 and shelter is essential for survival. It's time to regroup and reconsider the attempt. Well, basically, we're just getting chased out by the wind and uh, 
lack of uh, energy because of that, over. Two opinions emerge, one for abandonment, the other for a last desperate drive at the peak. That if the wind doesn't die within a few days, uh, if we go at it, we'll have to go as a small team, alpine style. Just go. You guys have to put in six, carry O2, right? 12 loads worth, and then still have the energy to go for the summer. That, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. I think I, what you're leaving out, I think, is the loading. The carrying the loads from five to six. The three of you, right, yeah. you each have to carry four loads. Well, don't get me wrong in my thinking here. I, uh, you know, when I say, well, maybe this time next week we could be celebrating, it is a possibility. Let's not rule that out. But it's, it's yeah. I don't want you to think that I'm going to mad dog it up there and uh, sort of grab two bottles from Camp 5 and say, well, I'm going to the summit. See you, team. The argument is not resolved, nor pressed to the limit. They agree to disagree. The climb leader heads down with a load of equipment. Three climbers remain to plan their attempt with minimal support. That brings us up to the sixth, so we're really critical. So it means the seventh critical. is the uh, summit day. It means the seventh is the summit day, and it means we have seven full climbing days. Yeah, Can which, we which, that? which means that we have to climb irregardless of the wind. Irregardless, but, and it means every single day we have to do something. You know, this is our last shot. We're gonna give it our best shot. And uh, for everyone, for the team, for, for Canada. It's only 5,000 feet from here to the top. A short hop for climbers like these at lower altitude. They test equipment and check supplies, steal their nerves for the ordeal ahead. What they are about to attempt, a race for the peak, has littered the mountain with corpses. For every two climbers to make the summit from here, one has died. They leave late afternoon, when the winds seem to drop. The winds didn't drop, they increased. For five hours, the trio climbed, reaching Camp 5 at dusk, only to find it gone, blown off the mountain. If they were to survive the night, they had to get back to Camp 4. Winds were rising at 100 plus. Temperatures plunged to 40 below. A radio call to base camp planned for 9 p.m. never came through. Those below were forced to face the possibility of disaster. It was 2 a.m. when the climbers staggered into Camp 4, exhausted but alive. They were defeated. The attempt was over. Next morning, they begin the tortuous descent from the North Call. For these people, the most disappointing, most arduous trek of their lives. They are shells of men now, very little left inside them. With the bright light of challenge ahead extinguished, the gloom of failure fills the narrow world they perceive. Even the downhill climb tests their endurance to the limit. They couldn't know that defeat was inevitable, that the jet stream winds, which dropped for winter, had dropped early, closing their window on Everest. A fall ascent of the northeast ridge remains unclimbed. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's enough for one day. That's enough for one day, boy. But the summit was not their sole obsession. While success was denied them in one, did they achieve the other? Well, the failure of the climb, I don't think it's a failure. If you think about the mountaining aspect of it, uh, of course, we didn't reach the summit. I guess Chumalungma didn't want us to be there. So we couldn't make it the summit because of the high wind and the very cold environment. Uh, however, when we came here, there was not only to climb the mountain. There was to climb a mountain for a charity, for a cause. Our timing here was out. The, the mountain, uh, the jet streams came early. And things could not have been done differently uh, from a, a climbing point of view. Our struggle, I think, is directly analogous to the struggle that parents with Rett syndrome girls have on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. We did not reach the summit of Mount Everest, and maybe that's a good thing, because uh, that almost would have symbolized an end to the, uh, the struggle for Rett syndrome. They climbed for hope hoped that their effort would make us aware of a baffling medical puzzle, newly identified. They gave it everything they had. Whether or not they succeeded is for us to decide. <laughs>